To this day, you can still find hidden gold in the hills of California, or you can uncover an unknown fossil in the middle of a busy city. Those unclaimed, incredible discoveries are just waiting for the right person, the right explorer, to make their way to the right spot at the right time. For Nolan Sykes, that day came on May 25th, 2020, the fateful day when he finally struck gold. He'd spent weeks smashing a digital pickaxe into the rocky crags of Craigslist with nothing to show for it. Then suddenly, a glint of something kinda shiny, an inconspicuous listing posted from Ventura, California that included the word Hemi. There's nothing shiny on that car. Not even the glass. <laughs> There's, there's no shine. It'll, it'll get there. It'll get there. It may have only had 180 theoretical horsepower and a theoretical top speed of 80 miles per hour, and maybe it also weighed 5,000 pounds, but it had history. It had patina. It had power windows and was over 70 years old. It was a 1952 Chrysler Imperial. That thing belongs in a junkyard, James Pumphrey said as Nolan rolled it off a trailer into James's side yard. You take that back, replied Nolan defiantly. Never, but you should take that back, James said, pointing to the aged Chrysler, shaking his head. <sighs> Nolan was quiet. When he finally spoke, the words seemed to come from a place deep within him. Haven't you ever had a time? Where you just needed someone to believe in your potential. Where if the right person saw you in the right way, a beautiful future might be possible. A single tear rolled down James's cheek. I see you right now, Nolan. Clearer than I ever have before. This Chrysler isn't a heap of junk. It's family. And family is gold. The rest is history, and history is what past gas is all about. Today on the show, it's Barn Finds Part 2. How does an ultra-rare Shelby Daytona vanish for decades after breaking a slew of records? What does it take for an entire car dealership to vanish into history? What happens when one of the most famous Mustangs of all time turns up in a Mexican junkyard? There's gold in them thar podcasts. <laughs> This is Past Gas Prospector. Let's go. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars. It's not about ports. Let's, Let's go. go. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning, my my co-hosts. Oh, good morning to you. It might thank you. It might not be morning to when you're when you're listening to the show, but it is here when we're recording it. This is Past Gas. We are talking barn finds yet again. It was a topic so nice, we had to do it twice. I'm joined by my co-host, as always. We got uh, J James Pumphrey. My pal, baby! My <laughs> pal, baby! Nice. And Joe Weber. Keep it juiced! Speaking of uh, barn finds. You went to you just went to Jay Leno's barn, right? I did. His his barn. I went to <laughs> Jay Leno's barn. It's very big. Uh, yeah, I was... Um, Invited by Larry Chen. It's that was your first time there. That was my first time at Jay Leno's place. It's so cool. It's such like I still have the uh, the guest passes from when I went in my car, and every time I clean up my car, I'm like, yeah, I kind of made it. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's amazing. It's just he's got a lot of old old cars. Yeah, and not like it's funny. Our version of our Jay Leno garage, James, I think would. Would be a lot different, a lot more JDM stuff, a lot more mm -hmm. newer stuff. Jay's got, got a lot of like he's got a lot of important. long cars. Yeah, yeah. very long cars. <laughs> he's got a lot of uh, cars that have been featured in Looney Tunes episodes. <laughs> <laughs> he has yeah. like a bunch of like sixteen-cylinder Hispano Suizas, right? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. saw the Hispano. Yeah, uh, he, that's pretty cool he car. Has, he has multiple cars with uh, World War II fighter plane engines in them. Multiple, yeah. like four, <laughs> like four or five or six. <laughs> Larry Chen reached out to us, uh, and I was able to go. Uh, Larry is like just the best photographer. Larry the photo guy. Larry the photo guy, and yeah, got to tour his, got to tour Jay Leno's facility. Very awesome. He's got a whole side for his collection, and then there's a whole side that has like a bunch of old antique steam equipment, like giant steam engines that like ran factories 
and then that's where like his the the shop is where like uh they restore his cars or maintain them and he has this like 90s kitchen just in the middle of Dude, it. Dude, the kitchen. Yeah, there's like a full kitchen in the shop, which is sick. He's got like a bunch of like Tonight Show memorabilia around his collection, the collection side. So like the set of the Tonight Show or the stage, at least, that he was like on and his desk is like there. Uh, super sick. When, when we went, we walked in and he is sitting at the ki- in the kitchen eating a steak and a big <laughs> potato <laughs> for in lunch. A, in a Canadian tuxedo? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was rocking the full denim. Nice. Uh, and then the second part of the day, we uh, they turned on the softbox in like the studio area where they mm-hmm. shoot Jay Leno's garage. And uh, we were able to roll in a few cars. The first car we shot was like a GT4 car, uh, Toyota Supra, which that is the first cool. one in North America. Dude, it's so sick. I haven't like touched the photos yet, but like that thing is awesome. I want to, I'd love to drive a GT4 car. Um, and then. We got to do both of his four GTs, and I just posted some pics of the the 2005. It's a red one with white stripes. Nice, uh, amazing well, car. Can I ask you something? Yeah. As Donuts registered patina file, was it a little disappointing to see all these cars so shiny? Uh, a lot of them are shiny, but he's also like the the Bruff room, for example. Like a lot of those Bruff. motorcycles are either like. They're either in original condition or like restored, right? There's like not a lot of in between. So like the ones that were in original condition had like not rust, but like you know they were like blistering and blister. There was patina on them. Uh, that was really cool. And then there he had a he has a 300 SL Gullwing uh, race car. Oh yeah, cool. that car is so cool. It's Gullwing. Gullwing. Oh, like it's got the. The, the seagull wings. I thought it. I know. I thought it. You were. It was like a special edition that had like gulling. zombie <laughs> arms that went up like yeah. that. The gulling. No, but that that was one of my favorite cars of the collection. Uh, those, I think that might those. be my favorite one because it, yeah, it's an unrestored race car and like the paint is cracking. Well, speaking of cool uh, ghouls, <laughs> 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 why don't we jump into this story? Sure. This one's called the Curse of Phil Spector. <laughs> We here at Pass Gas, of course, love barn finds. They're like a miniature dose of automotive history hidden under a layer of dust for us to uncover. Sometimes that history is cool. Sometimes it's a little creepy. And in the case of our first barn find today, it's a bit of both. If you're a music fan, you probably know the name Phil Spector. Before Spector became an estranged weirdo who murdered actress Lena Clarkson in his palatial mansion in Alhambra, California, he was a record producer at the top of his game. Throughout the 60s and 70s, he was working his magic for acts like Tina Turner, the Ramones, Leonard Cohen, and more. He even produced a little album called Let It Be by some band you've probably never heard of and, you know, probably doesn't even slap. It's probably overrated, too. Yeah, that (laughs) album does not slap. If your parents had a vinyl collection, or if you do, for that matter, you hipster, chances are Spectre's signature sound is part of that the, collection. The wall of sound. I was in a play about the Ramones recording um, their album with Phil Spector. The, he was most famous for working with like Motown bands, though. Like These are all down his career a little bit, but he, he got famous because he developed that wall of sound for... Motown artists. Yeah, like Ronnie Spector, the Ronettes. That was his wife. Yeah. And he used to make her go into the basement and get into a glass coffin just to remind her that he could kill her if he wanted to. Oh, God. Yeah. What? Yeah, he's a psychopath. <laughs> While Spector is now mostly known for all the murdery stuff, as well as his wild wigs that's covered up his extensive head scars from a 1974 near fatal car accident he used to be known for racing through the hollywood hills fraser crane style in a magical car that was more than just flashy it was part of racing history a custom-made shelby cobra daytona coupe that came from the blessed hands of carol shelby himself that's pretty cool in 1964 shelby had delivered six cobra coupes to the daytona international speedway these snakes delivered some serious bite They dominated the course and for the first time ever delivered the FIA World Manufacturers Championship to an American manufacturer. Very cool car. 
Then in 1966, the FIA handed down new rules about production runs and engine sizes that rendered the six Cobras ineligible for further racing. It's weird. It's almost as if like every time you beat Ferrari, they make new rules that make your cars <laughs> illegal. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Every time Ferrari gets stomped, it's just like new rules that make the guy who beat him illegal. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, five of the coupes wound up in Shelby's Venice, California garage, but one of them, dubbed CSX-2287, was taken out to the legendary Bonneville Salt Flats with a car set 23 national and international speed records with Craig Breedlove behind the wheel. After the jaunt out to Utah, the record-setting car traded hands and wound up in the probably very creepy garage of Phil Spector uh, with the aforementioned glass casket. I was in the basement, but I'm sure there was other creepy stuff in the garage. <laughs> he spent years bombing the race car through Los Angeles, racking up an alarming amount of moving violations. So many, in fact, he eventually gave the car to George Brand, a former cop who did some work around Spectre's home. Hmm. After that, CSX 2287 vanished for 30 years. And that's when the story of the car takes a even more morbid twist. In October of 2000, George Brand's daughter, Donna O'Hara, picked up her two rabbits and walked onto a hiking trail near her Fullerton, California residence, carrying two gallons of gasoline. For unknown reasons, she doused herself and the rabbits before striking a match and burning 98% of her body. Later that night, in a nearby hospital, she died from the extensive burns. Back in her house... In the garage, under layers of bedsheets, sat a 1964 Shelby Daytona that hadn't been driven in years or maybe decades. Donna left no instructions for what should be done with the car, setting off a years-long legal battle. Family, friends, and acquaintances poured out of the woodwork to claim the CSX-2287. Then, Robert Shapiro, O.J. Simpson's lawyer, showed up and claimed Phil Spector never sold the car to Brand and that he wanted it back. And in the end, the courts decided that nobody was right. The sixth Daytona wound up at the Simone Foundation Automotive Museum in Philadelphia. Uh, Those poor yeah. rabbits. What I do know. they ever do? You know? Man, no, maybe man. they were rascally rabbits. That's just... <laughs> uh, I think we're focusing on the wrong aspect of the story. Uh, I think it's very, very uh, typical that after this poor woman obviously going through a lot of pain and deciding to take in a very extreme measure and passes away then all of a sudden all these people come out and just just wriggle their way out of the out of the woodwork to be like oh let me get that car yeah donna's i'm so sorry donna passed away but where's that car give me the if, car if i passed away would you guys try to claim my shiro depends on how you passed away if you took your dog into the woods and burnt yourself i think i'd focus on that first Oh my I'd God. be like, yeah. what? Did, yeah. What did we do? How could we have helped prevent this? Yeah. Um. But if you, yeah, I think if you went skydiving or bungee jumping, yeah, and had an accident, I think like within a couple weeks, I'd be like, hey, Rachel, what's up? <laughs> what's up with uh, <laughs> what's up with Joe's car? Do you need me to like clean it or anything? <laughs> yeah. It's like like I wouldn't be like you know I mean. He went skydiving. I mean, he <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because you said that, I'm gonna bequeath it to you. Oh, thanks, bud. Speaking of bullets, uh, this <laughs> next t this next tale of bonds is called uh, the missing bullet. This is like the Simpsons treehouse of horror of uh, past gas. The farmhouse of horror. Oh, damn! The barn house. In the grand scheme of barn finds, sitting under some bed sheets in a garage is actually a pampered life. Sometimes wildly famous and high profile cars have to suffer in the baking sun in an overgrown backyard in Mexico, for instance. In 1968, the Academy Award winning and highly influential movie Bullet hit the theaters and made the three year old Ford Mustang featured on the poster an instant pop culture icon. Driving it in the movie was fellow icon and speedster Steve McQueen, who single-handedly taught filmmakers and fans alike what a real movie car chase was all about. Did he direct Bullet? No. We had a, um, uh, an Academy Award-winning sound designer on an episode of The D-List uh, yeah. on our YouTube channel. 
and he was saying that bullet the uh the chase and bullet is like the best sound design of any car chase because steve mcqueen or, or whoever drove the car yeah knew how to drive it so when they mm -hmm. recorded the sound he's like rev matching and uh like like it there's just so much action going on in the sound that normally isn't there that's awesome so he that's all location sound yeah that's like the gold standard of car chase sound cool. really because you can like hear the you can hear him working he's like yeah. playing with the clutch because nothing takes you out of it more as a car fan when you're watching a movie than hearing engine noise that doesn't come from that car and you're like wait that's not a v8 or, yeah it know? doesn't yeah it doesn't come from that car or it's like that's not what it would sound like right there yeah yeah. But like bullets, like there's like work, there's, <laughs> there's work going on, not just like yeah, yeah. true, true, true. Dude, you just Haven't gave the scat man a run for his money, James. Yeah, wow. we I'm gonna be in police academy eleven. <laughs> <laughs> McQueen drove a custom 1968 Ford Mustang 390 GT straight into history while pursuing a 1968 Dodge Charger through San Francisco's hilly streets. The beastly hero performed moves through the narrow streets that the Fast and Furious crowd would be proud of, including drifting a 4,000-pound Charger around several corners. Tires squeal, shocks are blown out, and fenders are crunched all up until the end, which, spoiler alert, I mean, it's like a 50-year-old movie, uh, resulted in the fiery crash of the Charger. What most people don't know is that there were two 390 GTs that McQueen drove. One was the face of the movie, i.e. the hero car. That's what they use for close-ups uh, and stuff. That's what the like, lead actor drives. Uh, it stayed polished and pristine. The other was the workhorse that got beat to hell and wound up being towed to a California scrapyard where it was completely forgotten. Actually, having two cars is like way less than normal. I think like yeah. in the first Fast and Furious, they had six of each car. And now like depending on depending on how many scenes the car is in the movie, they have like a ton, a ton of them in various degrees of like doneness. Yeah. And like you know the I mean? like detail. Yeah, and there's uh you know, <clears throat> they strip out a bunch if it's a car that's gonna go on a jump. Right. Yeah, and then they also have like just interiors of cars that they put on process trailers. Yeah. Um we made a series called How to Stunt, where we cover a lot of this. And also Craig Lieberman's uh YouTube is it's particular, but it's a fun watch every once in a while. So he's the guy who did all the Fast and Furious cars. The pony sat in the junkyard for years, rotting away until someone dragged it to Baja, Mexico, where it was painted candy apple red and turned uh. into a beat to hell, bullet riddled and very rough daily driver, which soon broke down. It was then abandoned between two palm trees in a backyard. God. Years later, the rusted heap was spotted by a man named Hugo Sanchez, who planned to convert it to an Eleanor replica uh, from Gone in 60 Seconds. He ran a report on the van and discovered the true lineage of the Mustang. It was then he undertook a full restoration in hopes of a big sale down the road. While that's still pending, he has reasons to see dollar signs. The first 390 GT that was kept clean sold for $3.4 million. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, at Mecham Auctions, making it the most expensive Mustang ever sold. Wow. You know, I wonder if like you could like raise investors for the restoration. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, for sure. If I found that car, like I couldn't afford to restore it in the no. way that it would need to be restored. We can tell that by my current car collection. <laughs> um, but like, I wonder if you like, if you, if you're like, all right, so this other one sold for $3.4 million. Yeah. I imagine this will go for at least half that. It's not the hero car. Because what least, were you gonna put like fifty, sixty thousand dollars in it most at most? I, I, I bet. <laughs> oh, Joe! Oh, you naive child! I bet. No, what? What no. do you? Th what? What do you think, Nolan? One to two hundred grand for a re for like a full on restoration? Yeah. Yeah, probably like two hundred grand. Yeah, at yeah. least, at least. 
depending on like the shop and their labor rates too. It's not the parts and and the materials that cost a lot. It's the labor. It's the, yeah. the all the hours. Um, I mean, yeah, if you were doing it yourself, Joe, you'd probably spend fifty to sixty thousand dollars. That's on what parts. I'm talking about, Nolan. Don't yeah. treat me like a kid, all right? I <laughs> I've restored a ton of cars in in my garage. <laughs> How's that forerunner coming? Uh, the engine's being rebuilt right now. By is it really? Me. Yes. Okay. Well, at least that's going down. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so much labor. So much cost. So much money. If if it were like a vegetable or something, it'd probably be like a pumpkin of an undertaking. Speaking of pumpkins, before the bullet <laughs> Mustang ever set records at auction, Elvis Presley was setting records for the most number one albums on the U.S. charts. Until Drake. <laughs> you don't hear Drake bring up Elvis much. I think he's afraid to. Afraid to Got bring more up the slaps king. than Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shaking my pelvis. I got more slaps than Elvis. <laughs> the only word that rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everything the king touched turned to gold, and he was handsomely rewarded for his talents. He quickly amassed an impressive car collection, which included a Daytona Soul Pantera, which we've covered on Bumper to Bumper. Uh, he famously shot it with a gun. Yeah. Uh, he bought a, a Stutz Blackhawk 3, a Ferrari Dino 308, and a bunch of caddies and other kingly automobiles. Yeah, you got you to gotta buy a bunch of cars when you're, when you're the king. But one of the coolest cars Elvis ever drove never got parked in his permanent collection at Graceland. In 1958, the king of rock and roll found himself drafted into the U.S. Army and wound up sitting out the Korean War on a German base. While abroad, however, he found himself in need of a proper automobile. He found it in the form of a BMW 507, a tiny convertible coupe that was intended to bring the German car company into the sporting market. Only 254 of these roadsters were ever built, and all of them were slightly different in hand assembled, which of course, Turn them into instant classics. Uh, I think these are beautiful cars. They are. We talk about it quite a bit in the uh, episode of Up to Speed on the BMW Z8. Yes. Uh, this is an obvious influence on the Z8. Um, and yeah, Elvis actually did play a relatively large role in making this car come to America. That's beautiful. Anyway, the 507 was already special. Before Elvis took ownership, the miniature V8 had a full career racing and winning hill climbs all over Northern Europe, driven by Hans Stuck, who you'll remember from our Nazi episode as a driver who raced for the Silver Arrows. Uh, Stuck even drove the little BMW to car shows and rolled it onto the set of the Bavarian film Hula Hop Connie before the king. Hula <laughs> 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 Hop Connie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> before the king found it parked at a Frankfurt BMW dealership. Presley went on to have his 507 further customized. BMW swapped in a lightweight V8 and sprayed the car bright red. See, Elvis had a serious problem. All those European lady fans were leaving bright red kisses all over his ride, and it was distracting to the other soldiers. The red was as good as camouflage for the king. That's very strange. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> I have you ever let's kiss a, his car let's yeah. kiss his car we're big car people uh I've never we're probably I've, in the top five percent of car nerds I would say in terms of like fanaticism have you ever kissed a car I've probably kissed a car honestly <laughs> all right well I probably I I probably kissed a car <laughs> you know <laughs> Big thanks to Sunday Lawn Care for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Fellas, <laughs> you guys got problems with your lawn like me? It's spring, and you know what that means. Your lawn's running into a bunch of different problems, whether that's brown spots, bare patches, pesky weeds, or even nibbling grubs. We got a bunch of gnats that are eating all of our tomato plants, so that's what I'm dealing with right now. But you don't have to see your lawn just slowly die a horrible death. Sunday Lawn Care is here to help your lawn thrive. Sunday is more than just a lawn care product. It's a custom lawn care plan with a variety of ways to help you grow a beautiful lawn, control weeds, and remove pests. They take out all the guesswork. Literally, all you have to do is put your address in, and they'll scan your property and tell you how much product you need, 
what your soil composition and rainfall is like. They'll send you a custom pack of like everything you need for your lawn, which is really cool. There's no guesswork, but then there's also add-ons like uh, weed control, seeds or pest control, which I got all of those and they work great. I was super impressed by it. Like literally all I did was just put my address in and they sent me something like two days later with everything that I needed to take care of my lawn. And after I used it, my lawn is seriously thriving. Like there's no more pests, the weeds have gone away, and the plants that I want to be there are doing great. If I listen hard enough, I can hear my plants thanking me. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for making us green. Let Sunday take the guesswork out of your growing a greener, more beautiful lawn this spring. Visit GetSunday.com slash PAST, that's P-A-S-T, to get $20 off your custom lawn plan at checkout. That's $20 off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash PAST. Thank you, Sunday Lawn Care. Anyway, after the war, Elvis and his car hopped on a plane and wound up back in the States. The 507 was sold to a Chrysler dealership where someone dropped in a Chevy V8 into the tiny car and gave it a renewed life as a race car in Alabama and Florida, of all places. Why did he bring it back only to sell it right away? Eh, you know, when you're a celebrity, you just do that, you know? Yeah, dude. That's what I do. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I like that he essentially, like, LS swapped it. The guy LS swapped it, and then it went racing. (laughs) That's what I'm going to guess. Wiped all those kisses off of it. Yeah. Look, look, pull the engine. Keep the kisses. <laughs> <laughs> the car was then sold to Jack Castor, a California engineer who had plans to restore the car to its original glory, even though he had no clue about the Elvis connection. And as we all know, a restoration project can quickly become a store your car somewhere until you can get around to it project. I don't like to think of that. Caster's storage place of choice was an aging pumpkin warehouse <laughs> where the 507s... Where, wait, what? Pumpkin warehouse? You mean a barn? What? <laughs> anyway, the 507 sat for almost 40 years until Caster saw an article about the King's lost BMW in 2006. He reached out to BMW and they cut a deal to acquire the coupe and do a full restoration. It took almost 10 years before the King's Coupe was revealed at the 2016 Pebble Beach Car Show to an adoring throng of fans who politely restrained themselves from leaving lipstick kisses on the bonnet. They're like, we'll buy it back, but you got to throw in some of them pumpkins. Yeah, let's hear more about them them, them pumps, (laughs) them them (laughs) pumpykins. That's what you call your your family, right, James? Pumpkin? Yeah, my (laughs) pumpkin. Lem's pumpkin. Hey, put that. Oh, you hold your fire. That's pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> They're welcome in this holler anytime. <laughs> Get yourself some turkey and make yourself comfortable. I'll be back with a hot bottle. Oh, hot my God. water James, bottle. What? I, I want to go with you so badly to find your like extended, extended family. Out, just out in the boonies, out in the out holler, in, out, out, out in the, the holler. <laughs> <laughs> While some cars are stars of the silver screen, getting all the girls and high fives, others fly under the radar. In autumn of 1963, Porsche debuted an innovative little sports coupe that would change sports cars forever. They called it the Porsche 901. Uh, Porsche and Levi's kind of named their products in the same way, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. A year later, the Porsche factory was pumping out 901s, and they were selling like hotcakes until a phone call from the lawyers at Peugeot put a stop to manufacturing. It seemed the French car maker... This is, we've covered this a lot. This is so petty in French. Uh, the French car maker claimed naming rights to any vehicle that had three numbers for a name in which the middle one was zero. And Porsche was like, I love it. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Sure. We'll go with it. (laughs) They ditched the zero and introduced a hero. None other than the newly renamed, instantly iconic 911. That's a good move, IMO. They were like, all right, man. (sighs) Like the the lack of thought even that went into it was like, (sighs) yeah, we'll make it a one. (laughs) <laughs> are you is are you cool with that? As long as it's not a zero. <laughs> I think we can leave it at uh, uh, 
<laughs> you know, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> But before the badge swap, Porsche had assembled 82 of the 901s and released them to excited owners who drove the heck out of the cars. In fact, the cars were literally driven out of existence. For 50 years, the curators at the Porsche factory collection scoured the planet for surviving 901 with no luck. The model was as good as extinct. That would be a f- like that would be fun to be like part of that group. That's like, like I gotta go to Egypt. Yeah, I gotta. <laughs> I gotta lead on a missing nine oh one. But for anyone who's seen one of the many Drax kick parks, knows that <laughs> extinction is just the beginning. On August fifth, twenty fourteen, when Alexander Klein, the manager of the classic car collection at the Porsche Museum, got a phone call from a reporter at RTL two, a German TV station, a team digging out a long abandoned collection had found a pair. Of old 911s, not the 901s, but cool enough for a story. The reporter ran down the details of the cars while Klein nodded along, confirming the car's 911 heritage until he got to the VIN. As he read the numbers off, 30057, Klein almost dropped his hot dog that he was (laughs) eating at the time. This wasn't just any old rotting 911. This was a rotting 901. Porsche immediately dispatched their crack team of experts to the Brandenburg farm to inspect the two vehicles, probably while wearing white gloves and some sort of scary mask and jacket. They're known for that kind of stuff. (laughs) Upon entering the barn, they first saw a gold 911L in really awful condition, just completely rotted away. Then at the back of the barn, they found the survivor covered in a thick layer of of what most believe to be dust. (laughs) The front fenders and a large section of the front end were long ago eaten by Nolan's favorite friend, Rust. The interior was mostly held together with spooky, spooky cobwebs, and both the brakes and engine were fully seized. But you can make out the chassis number for sure. And it proved that this was the 901 they've been hunting down for more than 50 years. Wow. While it was number 57 off the production line, it is now number one in Porsche's heart. Has it been restored? Do you know how the show works? Do you think I know that? (laughs) I don't know. It's been fully restored, and it's been fully restored, and Joe, look out your window. (laughs) <laughs> it's on your back porch. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> well, this thing is cool. There's like, they put chickens on it for this photo shoot. Well, speaking of chickens, while we know not all barn finds are found inside the barn or even on top of the barn, some are found right out in the open, specifically the case of our next find, a Welsh garden. This story involves one of our favorite brands here at Pass Gas, Land Rover, and begins in 1948 at the Amsterdam Motor Show. Amsterdam. Oh, dude, that's like, dude, the most, dude, like, look at that car, dude. Oh, <laughs> my God, that car is so sick. The, at the time, brand new truck company bought three pre-production prototype Land Rovers, dubbed RO1s, to a handful of auto shows around Europe, showing off their all-new designs, which were rivaling the Willis Jeep at the time, but more focused on farm work. Up until that point, Rover had been a luxury car maker, and post-World War II, nobody wanted luxury cars. They wanted to get to work. They wanted to get their little paws dirty. So they pivoted to farm trucks, and thus, a legend was born. It's so weird how it came full circle, though, where, like, yuppies started buying them in the 80s, and then it became a luxury brand again. Yep. That's how it goes, man. Back at Rover HQ, they moved forward with R01 production. And for some reason, the bosses decided to sell off the prototype light-duty trucks to private owners. The little R01, now nicknamed Huey by the new owner because of its license plate, H-U-E-166, vanished into the English countryside, never to be seen again. The 1950s and 60s saw little Huey ripping across hilly landscapes, dragging tree stumps out of the ground and hauling animals to market. Huey was a true workhorse, and every year that passed took a toll on the car's exterior. By 68, Huey was parked for good in a garden. 
The owners used Huey as a, quote, static power source and ran the vehicle to spin the farmer's wood saw what? until the <laughs> yeah until the motor seized in 1988. Is that like a uh, common farm thing to do? Yes. So, uh, yes. For like um, on tractors specifically. Uh, usually there's either a, a, a output shaft on the front or the rear of the tractor. So yeah. while you're pulling it, uh, there, you know, there's a drive shaft attached to you. Like, I think the rear differential and, uh, it spins at that point after, uh, the motor sees the truck just sat there dead and overgrown with nettles. Love those nettles, nettles. until a starry eyed Land Rover collector spotted Huey and towed it back to its, his own garden just a few miles down the road from the original Land Rover factory in Solhul. I don't Solo know how to pronounce it. Solohol. 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 The new owner knew he had something special, maybe even an early prototype, but he had no idea how important it was. Once again, Huey sat rotting away in a garden, hoping that one day the owner would get around to starting that restoration, but that day never came. Instead, the owner put it up for sale, but by then, Huey was up to its axles in mud, and it took Jackson a special tow truck to free it. Finally, Word got around a Land Rover Classic, and they bought the car for an unpublicized amount. It's probably safe to say that Huey was, by then, the most expensive wood saw motor ever sold. I like how in Cars 2, they throw some subtle shade at Land Rover, where he's like the villain, and he's got a really polluting engine. Remember that? I do. I thought that was a very predictable villain reveal. Caught me off guard. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> I guess everyone's got their secrets, though. There's a reason that they're called barn finds and not street finds. For one, in big cities, space is at a premium. There's no room for a car to just sit and rust. It's also more likely that parked in view of a street, someone at some point will recognize the car's value and make an offer. There are countless stories about people knocking on someone's front door and buying the snoozing Mustang or 240SX parked dead in the driveway. So it's a bit unusual to discover a treasure trove of rare gems hiding in a barbed wire guarded lot halfway between downtown LA and Compton, right along the heavily trafficked thoroughfare of Alameda Street. It's there that Porsche Foreign Auto sits nondescript amongst a row of wrecking yards, salvage shops, and parts depots that get picked clean on a daily basis. In a 2012 issue of Town and Country, writer Michael Mraz discovered the rarest Mercedes Benz ever made sitting in the South Central Scrapyard, a 1935 Mercedes Benz 500K Roadster limousine, just rotting. The entirely custom, elegant car was created as a personal gift for Rudolf Caracciola as a thank oh, yeah. you for winning oh. the European Drivers' Championship three times, a feat that had never been accomplished. The 500K was powered by a supercharged 5-liter V8 that produced a whopping 160 horsepower, which was a pretty big deal at the time considering some commuters were still using horses with buggies. Modern estimates think that if the car wound up at auction, it would fetch more than $10 million due to its significance. Oh I God. mean, the, the um, Grand Wagoneer was making less than that out of a V8 in 1991. Yeah, this one's supercharged, too. Yeah. And that wasn't the only amazing car that Rudy Klein, owner of Porsche Foreign Auto, managed to keep hidden from the world. When he died in 2001, his sons, Ben and Jason, took control of the yard and all of its hidden treasures. I thought it was going to be Ben and Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and then they turned it into Ice Cream Empire. <laughs> hidden gems. It's got, like, uh, cookie dough and yeah. bits of chocolate. When Michael Mraz, the journalist, was allowed to explore the lot, he also found a matching pair of pre-war Maybox, mm. one of the only two Izzo Griffo spiders ever created, one Those of only cool. 29 alloy-bodied Mercedes gull wings, and a handful of BMW 507s and 502s, six Lamborghini Muras, and the only remaining version of the Horch 8. 55 Special Roadster, one of only seven built. And this model was personally owned by Ava Braun, Hitler's f girlfriend. Oh my nah, God. No, no, I'll pass. I'll pass. I don't need that. Don't need <laughs> yeah. that. I don't need that car. 
Finding all those cars in the same chunk of land in South Central Los Angeles is like walking into a 7-Eleven in Miami and finding not one, but seven Holy Grails that people were using to drink slushies. <laughs> I bet they tasted real good, too. Uh, unless you choose the wrong one, then you yeah, turn yeah. into an old man really fast. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you think happened to them? They, didn't they melt? <laughs> in that Indiana was the Jones? Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, you can't look at the Ark of the Covenant or you'll melt. Okay. You can't drink from the wrong Holy Grail or you'll turn into an old man really fast. <laughs> After Rudy Klein's death, his sons managed to secure deals with Audi, formerly Horch, good name change, to yeah. restore the Eva Braun Roadster and the 500. Uh, <laughs> just like Audi, you're a huge company. Yeah. Let's just like eh. bad PR. It's like. We'll take it off your hands. We'll pay you for it. We will put it in a safe. But, like, don't publicly restore yeah. Hitler's girlfriend's car. It's like uh, <laughs> jo it's like Chip and Joanna Gaines. Like, oh, we're restoring uh, John Wayne Gacy's basement. <laughs> <laughs> this basement could be a real flex space, y'all. Let's make it open concept. Let's knock down <laughs> these walls. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we. Oh. John would have loved this shiplap. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we found something interesting in the walls when we were knocking down. <laughs> yeah, we we're really use this as a centerpiece. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we want to celebrate the history of the house, so we put these little we put these boy bones. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah. do I live next to where John Wayne Gacy used to live? When it comes to car and home insurance, don't we deserve better? I know I do. I put my policy to the test and turn to Gabby. They literally stand for get a better insurance. Get it? G-A-B-I. Gabby, get a better insurance. Getting better insurance with Gabby means a better price for the same insurance coverage. Who knew something like this existed? They are the one true comparison platform with real rates. That's right, folks. They give you an apples to apples comparison of your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Progressive, Nationwide and Travelers all in one place, super easy. Use your current insurance information to get started and in just minutes, you'll be able to see the quotes for the exact same coverage you currently have and it's free to use. That's what I did. Uh, you know, I've been with my insurance company for a good while now. I'm paying all right rates. Yeah, logged in with my current insurance provider, got shown like 15 quotes. Gabby was able to save me like 700 bucks. That's amazing per year. Gabby customers save $961 per year on average. Put your policy to the test like I did. Get a better insurance with Gabby. It's totally free to check and there's no obligation. Go to gabby.com slash gas. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash gas. G-A-B-I dot com slash gas. Thank you, Gabby, for sponsoring the show. <laughs> Who knows what else could still be sitting in the Klein's lot or any of the other dozen lots dotting Alameda Street, not to mention the hundreds of industrial streets just like it in Los Angeles. While Klein and Sons had some incredibly rare gems rotting away just outside downtown L.A., Ray and Mildred Lambrecht from Pierce, Nebraska, had the exact opposite going on. On a small <laughs> plot of land in 1946, they opened up Lambrecht Chevrolet. On opening day, the Lambrechts put up balloons and even rented two live elephants to what? parade around the new dealership, which had a whopping 16 Chevys to sell. I just want to remind everyone, I've ridden an elephant probably over 100 times. Really? Yeah. Is that real? Yes. <laughs> How? My mom was in this like women's club, like this like, it's called Junior League. I don't know if they have them everywhere, but it's like ladies do charity stuff. And her thing every year was she threw this big fundraiser party at the zoo called Zubilee. And while she was planning it, we would go to the zoo multiple times a week for months for yeah. like m like years of my life. And while she was having meetings with people, I would ride an <laughs> elephant. <laughs> That's insane. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I would just ride an elephant in circles. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, I've ridden an elephant like... 120 times <laughs> <laughs> it does sound wow. like a bit <laughs> it's completely true it's yeah i mean that's probably the coolest uh detail of my entire life <laughs> i can't believe it's taken this long for that to come out 
I've told, I tell, I've I've mentioned it on all of our show, all of the shows that I host. Wow, the truth <laughs> comes to light. Wow. Anyway, the first year, the Lambrex sold all 16 cars, which I would hope so. That's really not that many. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they are in the middle of Nebraska. At the end of each year, they would move unsold stock into a warehouse so that maybe people would look and buy or maybe not. You know, When people traded in cars, they would also take them out to the family farm and park them, and those would either sell or they wouldn't. That philosophy turned into more than 500 cars parked in a warehouse and all over their farm. In 1996, the Lambrex gave up the Chevy franchise, and the cars sat until 2013, when someone finally convinced the 90-somethings that it was time to sell the cars. The auction lasted two full days, and more than 15,000 people from as far away as Sweden and Australia descended wow. upon Pierce, Nebraska, to watch as the fields of cars were auctioned off. Dude, this would be so sick just to be at. I would love to go there. Yeah. 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 It's such a just cool, the- like, a cool, the auction was amazing. But like w- that philosophy doesn't make any sense to me. No. Like if it didn't sell, why would you move it to some w- place where no one can even look at it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the auctioneer started with the cars that had been stored indoors of the dealership. The highest selling vehicle was a 1958 Chevy Cameo pickup with just 1.8 miles on the odometer. The second highest bid was a red 1963 Impala two-door hardtop with just 11 miles that brought in 97 and a half thousand dollars in 1978 Indy pace car edition Corvette with just four miles on the odometer scored 80,000 bucks for which is pretty amazing for a Malays era sports car even with historical significance all in all the Lambrecht collection brought in 2.8 million dollars and set them up for a tidy retirement at 90 years old Um, (laughs) that's a nice little thing for the grandkids this collection proves that you can always unearth a deal if you look hard enough while the highly coveted low mileage Chevys went for close to 100k, many cars on the list went for under $5,000, oh. including some 1955 Bel Airs, some early 70s Chevelles. Oh. That's me right there, and some late, and late 60s, 60s Camaros. Camaros for Ooh. less than five grand. They must wow. have been in really rough shape, man. While the chances of there being more Porsche foreign autos or Lambrecht Chevrolets out there is rare. There's always growing hope for tomorrow that there might be a field of NA Miatas found with some good <laughs> shade coverage. Who cares? <laughs> a warehouse filled with 90s NSXs and GTRs, or maybe, just maybe, a mint Supra hidden under a tree that hasn't been modded to disastrous effect. One of those dusty Miatas or GTRs will show up and bring a trailer and go for five figures, and a pristine 2016 Hellcat with 500 miles on it will sell for 200 k while it's fun to daydream about eye-popping model numbers and dollar amounts, let the lesson of Nolan and his Chrysler <laughs> stay with us. It's not always about getting rich with a barn find or even finding something that runs. <laughs> Sometimes it's about finding family. Porsche and Land Rover found their aging ancestors hidden away and restored them to their full glory. Others pulled back those barn doors and found some cool cars that are only important because of who drove them. But now I finally have my own project car even if it's more of an actual barn than a car. Damn, I feel like the writer had a little uh, vendetta against you. <laughs> no, yeah, a little. No. I, uh, I appreciate it. Speaking of eye-popping model numbers, uh, <laughs> I'm throwing a party this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, that does it for this week's episode of Past Gas. Joe, you found more bones in your yard, in in your neighbor's yard. Yeah, the bones. Oh yeah, man. Continues. I, I saw please, this on Twitter. Please update us on this. I found more of the same bone, so it is a femur. Still have to look and cross examine it and see if it may, it might be like a an arm bone right here. I don't know. It's not a dog's. It's not a coyote's. For 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 background, uh, Joe found a bone on a walk a few weeks ago. He has attempted to contact the LAPD multiple Three times. Three different police stations shooed me out of their lobby. The police do not want to touch this bone. I'm kind of running out of options. Someone tweeted at me that they're like an anthropologist and they'd take a look at it for me. So I think I'm going to hit that guy up pretty soon. Well, <laughs> to be fair, uh, they're busy pulling modified cars over and making them get state refed. So you know, they don't have time to solve murders. 
Thank you very much for listening this week. Big shout out to our writer, Jacob Desjardins. And shout out to you, dear listener, for supporting the show. And thanks to Tommy and Bridget for always being there for us. And just a big shout to Barnes, because without (laughs) Barnes, this particular episode would not have been possible. So I just want to thank giant structures and fields used to store hay and livestock. Follow James on all social media at James Pumphrey follow, take, take. And, his, and his pumpkin. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow Donut at Donut Media. All that good stuff. Please give us a review. You know what? I think we're going to start reading reviews on the show. I want to do that. So Let's do it. Only bad ones. If you have a really fun barn find story, send us a, a tell us. A, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, you can send that to passgas at donutmedia.com. Yeah. Yes. If you have an idea yes. for an episode you really want us to research and write, uh, hit us up at that email address and we'll consider it. All right. That'll do it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That'll do it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>